situation with, uh, you know, Carl trying to find uh, some grounding. You know, he just sounds very disoriented, you know, and everything. So he keeps bringing up, uh, you know, organized religion, that that's his, his way of going at it. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, Roy was bringing up uh, the uh, aspect of the uh, of the morality of the gods, which is, you know, to me is a little questionable. <laughs> you know? I had some thoughts. I mean, on that. yeah, what what is the morality of nature? I mean, or mm -hmm. let's say, what's the morality of an elf or a uh, a brownie or uh, of Pan? Say, well, my my thought on the whole morality of the gods thing was really, it's they view it as a right and wrong in the sense that, let's say, immoral actions. If everyone were to um, do those, and that to them, that's just uh, it's oh no, the psyche will never be realized if if you are to act this way. So to us, we call it immoral. Yeah, you no. really hit the hit the nail on the head. Hi, Roy. You know, like Young used to say that the animals are more moral than uh, we're just talking about morality a little bit. The animals are more moral than we are because they follow their inner law, and we don't. But I just wanted to show you a couple things. This is for you. Carl, too. Um, I just, uh, it's just, what is it we're doing here? This, you know, Young is not really the one that invented this, you know, uh, this uh, method. And uh, this, this is, uh, now this comes from um, the practice of psychotherapy by Marie Louise von Franz, you know, and uh, she was just fascinated by the Nascapi Cree, and they are, um, they are, this particular tribe was in um, Labrador, so it's in uh, in the Maritime Provinces, mm. you know, north of Maine. Yeah, I thought didn't Young talk about him? Them? Um, I didn't ever see Young talk about him, but this is from Marie Louise von Franz. Well, I guess this is from Man and His Symbols. You know, but she she also mentions it in practice of psychotherapy. But the pra the major obligation of an individual Nascapi. See, they had no myth. Mm. They had no fixed myth. Okay, the the myth of the Nascapi. Here she describes it. The major obligation of an individual Nascapi uh, is uh, to follow the instructions given by his dreams and then to give permanent form to their contents in art. Mm -hmm. What does that sound like to you? Now, now the whole idea is Dark it's, light. yeah, it's very alchemical because it's saying um, that you need to, uh, that the beat that unconscious images long for the light. Mm -hmm. They long for the light. And what are they missing? Ego ignores them completely. So what, what the, the light they're looking for and the heat they're looking for is for the ego to turn inward and consider them, you know, and also to make them manifest in the outer world. And the, the best way to do that is through art. Now here's, Roy, I, we were talking about morality last time. And here's, here's a statement uh, from about the Nascapi about morality. And, you know, like Jung says, the animals are more moral than us because they follow their inner law. But um, that lies and dishonesty will drive the great man away from one's inner realm. Uh, whereas generosity and love of one's neighbors and of animals attract him and give him life. Now, you know, the, the Nascapi Cree, too, are very, very primitive. You know, they are um, not one of the, they're, they're a, a tribe, extremely nomadic, 
um, never have a fixed place, you know, uh, and never had a fixed myth. So it, it's just very interesting. There was one other statement she made. Now, I actually have the book of, uh, that she's quoting from, if anybody ever wants to read it. Uh, is there, here's another one I think might be saying just the same thing. But it says, for the Nascopi Cree, a major obligation was to follow their instructions given them by their dreams and then give permanent uh, form to their contents and art. Now that means to, if we make this manifest in the outer world, then it has concrete reality where before it was smoke and air. You know, it was this strange, uh, strange nature of unconscious images. They are real, and yet they are not real by what we judge reality as. Reality is something that you can touch and knock on and pick up and, you know, is going to affect your, um, fit you, affect you physically in the outer world. But these, but they are real and they're the most real things that we have. But anyway, one who is receptive to the hints of Mr. Peo, uh, the companion within, got better and more helpful dreams. This companion also became more real with uh, the receptive person than in those who neglected them. Now, this is alchemy, you know. This is, this is the anima calling out, you know, do not reject me because I am dark and covered with mire. It's, she says, but it, it, what she's saying is, it's your lack of attention that has made me thus. I, can I? That's, that's yeah, beautiful. go ahead. What you said about being dark, I had a dream just last night. Um, I've had two dreams, I think, are related to the damn dream. They're, they're different, but they're, I think they are kind of just, you know, sequential in a way. But I had a dream last night where I met my ex-wife's new boyfriend, and he was a, definitely a Caucasian, but his skin was black, and it was covered in freckles. And I just, when you said that, covered in mire, I, I wondered if that somehow has, he was a nice guy. I really liked the guy. He was kind of um, shy. So that just, like, he, he was kind of afraid. He seemed, like, afraid, like I wasn't going to like him. Well, typically, now, if we're going to look at this just metaphorically, I mean, like, uh, let's say it represents beings or figures in the psyche. What we learned from Anna Marjula was that if you don't integrate either the anima or the shadow, they marry each other, you know? where you're supposed to become, uh, give your love to the shadow, um, understand the shadow, and uh, give your compassion to him. And, 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 you know, really the compassion, the idea, hi, Dawn, the idea of the um, integrating the shadow. Ed, Edward Edinger says, you integrate the shadow when you stop blaming others. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is it represents our compulsive behavior, things that we do unconsciously, you know, and we have no control over it. You know, this would be like me, you know, getting up in the middle of the night and eating, you know, when I know that's not good for me, you know, or drinking too much soda or something, you know, just going and going and going. I mean, yeah, I know that's not good for me, but I do it anyway. You know, and because I don't really have any control, so that's, I'm not integrating my shadow. And then, then if we don't, um, if the anima is not transformational, you know, she becomes uh, the, uh, she's going to transform us by other means. And it's usually, uh, you, you know, he, he, he who's not led by the fates is dragged by them. You know? <laughs> You know, so uh, that means that she's, it's really, it becomes 
um, there will be some compulsive neurotic behavior that we perform because we are unwilling to transform. Now, yeah. usually this uh, uh, comes, uh, uh, manifests as, uh, as addiction, you know, either to drugs or to money or to sex or to alcohol or anything yeah. that it has, um, we think brings us the divine quality the treasure hard to attain yeah. okay is the treasure hard to attain sex is the treasure hard to attain being high on on uh, cocaine is mm -hmm. the treasure hard to attain uh, just piling up money in your bank account right you no know? um that, the, so we mistake this physical treasure hard to attain for this one who is um, both real and not real, yeah. you know? So anyway, um, you know, I was thinking one other, hi, Sarah. Nice to see you on the video too. I, you know, I, and Roy, I was gonna tell you one other thing. You remember your dream about the six? Uh, there was some six thing. It was, it six. had the number six. Uh. I don't know a lot. I, when I had the Obama dream, I think it was six people yeah. in the well, in this periscope, and I, I get yes. six. I'm I'm a double six numerology, and I I have six all the time. I'm well, you know, six. I bet I was just thinking about that the other day, and you know how you make a a six into a four? No, like like this. I don't know if you can see it. You take oh, a square okay. and you draw a line through it. Then you got one, two, three, one, two, three, three and three is six, and it equals a four. So, it, 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 you know, that's, that's just right. uh, the way, one way you make it. And what's interesting about that is you've got one mm -hmm. triangle pointing to uh, as, as above, so below, you know. Yeah, now that's like also... That. Is is represented almost exactly, and I think it's just a a uh, trans uh, the same principle is when you see the uh, Israeli star or the Jewish star, you know, and that gives you the idea a little bit better, you know. Where, I don't well, know. that's a uh, that's a star, of David, the double yeah, triangle. Yeah, had that. He had that on his shield. I mean, people yes. saw that man; they ran. Yeah, and. But that that this this square that is has a bisecting line from one corner to the other is um, is just how you construct the star of David, you know. And then you take and you uh, turn it around a little bit, where you you invert the triangles, you know, uh, you know, so that you create that um, star shape, and and the square shape turns into a star but you can turn it back into a four but um anyway why don't we uh go on charles dream here because charles it's good to, to see you um because you were possibly not going to be able to make it but anyway um oh i'm reading my own dreams here <laughs> i think i better get the uh, he's reading my own dreams the telescopes arrive but not all the parts <laughs> that was my dream from last night. My wife, um, I, I got a telescope for Christmas. I was telling that I think that Charles would benefit from this telescope. But um, I was telling my wife that uh, that the rings of Saturn are degrading over time; they're getting smaller. And uh, she's, well, that's due to man-made global warming and. I said, it takes a spaceship going 75,000 miles an hour, seven years to get to Saturn. All right. So anyway, uh, let's let's go over Charles' dream again. And Ivan, I, I will, if you're ready, Ivan, um, with the dream, uh, we'll we'll do yours next. Okay. 
or Gary, whoever, you guys can bite each other. Okay, so Charles' um, dream. Uh, do you want to just state it again, Charles, so you can, if there's any... Uh, do you have the, the chat saved from last time by chance? Yeah, so I, can, I put can definitely in, uh, put it in the chat. Yeah, here, just a second. Because I had to kind of like revise it, make it a little yeah. bit more... Yeah, all right, well, let me... Um, let me put it in the chat. Let's see what I gotta do. Come on. This darn thing. But um, I'll just go ahead and explain it while you're yeah, doing that. All right. Uh, okay. I'm gonna put it in the chat. So I was in a classroom uh, with a bunch of children, and they were all at their tables, like studying or reading or something. It was very quiet, and um, I found myself on the verge of. A uh, powerful mystical experience, and every time I would draw closer to it, um, a child or a couple of children at a time, one or two, would become uncomfortable and get up from their seat and leave. And this happened over and over again. Um, one of the little girls said she was uncomfortable because she felt like she was being watched, and so. Every time they get up and leave, I suppose it kind of happens all over again. I don't feel like I'm going to have a mystical experience. I've become all right. And then, then it comes on again and starts building up and building up. And a kid leaves. And so after a while, there's only a few children left. And they're sitting at a table. And I go over there, and there's a bookshelf nearby. And I pick up a book off of the built bookshelf titled King David's Encounter with God. And pick it up, I put it on the table in front of them and open it. And it actually becomes a screen. It starts playing a video and explaining that uh, video games should not be played. They create a more and more chaotic situation that increases your chance in losing. And uh, that really ultimately unconditional love is the key or the goal okay uh, well i uh we'll just start on this again and uh um i'm gonna start with with ivan's very insightful thing a remark i think that when the psyche manifests in us the immature or, or childish as aspects of the ego tend to evaporate you know they slowly start to go away now i that really made sense to me and uh, um it, it it's better that so so these children are not necessarily and they they're kind of uh poeri turnus like things you know the the um peter pan i, I just to mention i was I, w I spent most of my life suffering as a poor eternist, um, living tangentially to life, no history, intersecting it at one point, you know, because I was so happy in the world of bliss. Why, why do I need to, to uh, anything that happens to me, if it's fight or flight, I flee, you know? So I really never engaged in life, and it, it really took me uh, this this aspect of and I think every one of us have this problem maybe not all of us but uh, I know Gary's mentioned it and I think Carl this might be something that you might experience too is grounding that you need to have a standpoint on the earth and I think this is what all these rooted things mean you know but anyway the chat the the Poeri Turnus is Peter Pan, and he lives in Never Neverland, the place where children never grow up. Okay, so the dream ego comes in and starts to have a almost overwhelming experience of the objective psyche. And as he integrates the objective psyche within the dream ego, the childish aspects of him feel they're being judged. Know, or being watched i think uh who, who was oh i think it was tim mentioned that it's sort of a um, what predators do to their prey 
you know, which is very true, but it's also sort of a judgmental thing. You know, if you want to make somebody nervous, you give them the, the death stare, you know, and, uh, you know, to express disapproval, you know. But anyway, so they start to leave. Okay. So now this is something that um, I think, you know, Charles uh, had that uh, amazing, and he's, he's not really said much about it, but an amazing vision where he almost seemed to have almost a near-death experience. And so he does feel a little bit strange in now in this uh, ordinary world because it was that experience was so vivid to him. Maybe he can talk about that in a second. But um, so one of the little girls feels as she's being watched. And uh, you, it, 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 as, the, as we integrate the objective psyche, the childish aspects in us become fewer and fewer. And then we put, okay, now we're moving on from the children, okay? We pick up a book uh, from a bookshelf entitled King David's Encounter with God. Now, what were we just talking about? the star of david okay now and and what was the dream where we really found out what the hamster was in the hamster cage was the the baby uh raccoon whose mother turns uh is star shaped and turns into a woman you know and then walks away so the hamster the instinctive aspect of it has a a a feminine quality and in reality she is the great mother or she's the anima now the reason she's in what they say a, a theoromorphic form or you know an animal form is the same reason that we uh, I thought of that exactly when uh, Mar Marina uh, mentioned that she saw an alligator you know uh, this is uh, when we uh, encounter the depths, before we um, have a relationship with it, it tends to have a very, um, you know, usually a serpent or a snake. You'll see these in the, in the alchemical emblems. You know, the first encounter with the psyche is as a dragon or a snake, you know, and later it becomes more of a unicorn or a, or a stag. And then later it becomes um, uh, the, uh, the, the wise old man, you know, who um, instructs the divine child who's born later. So anyway, so it's King David's encounter with God. So um, now King David, um, I think, sort of is the star king because he has a star. You know, it, he's, he's also represents um in he's always from the house of david okay comes the redeemer okay from the house of david comes the redeemer isn't that uh mysterious you know and so so the 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 first ancestor of the Redeemer and his encounter with the psyche. This is what that book's about. You know, the the deep, the deep past of the redeeming thing, the treasure hard to attain in us, um, is the star king, you know, and the first, uh, it, you know, there's an aspect of, of being um, the, uh, of, of the collective unconscious, the uh, realm of the ancestors, the realm of uh, images is the realm of the ancestors. Um, and so King David's encounter with God. And then, um, now more can be said about that, okay? Now we come in to a, this is the mysterious part that we're gonna need help on, okay? We, um, we fold open this book, on the desk, 
the one about the star king the 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 original ancestor of the of the house of david out of which the redeemer comes and his encounter with the psyche it turns into a video screen what okay so now it's a video screen and the, so remember what we're talking about is not a computer game we're talking about the wisdom of the star king and and the deep past of the redeeming thing okay and it's uh, now manifest as a video screen the video a video starts to be playing so now it is um expressing itself okay this thing and it's it's describing how video games should not be played because they cause the situation to become more and more chaotic and increase your chance of losing. Now, this is a very mysterious statement, and we'll have to, uh, I'm gonna unpack it while everybody else talks, but it ends with that pure, unconditional love is the goal or key. So there is a big thing we need to unpack there, but um, is that statement uh, and, uh, and uh, the last statement, the two statements. Okay, why don't we just go through Gary and uh, go around and and then I'm going to sit here and try to outline that statement so I can well head around. Okay, so you know it goes through these experiences with the children and it's like, but it doesn't seem successful to me because he doesn't get the mystical experience and the children, you know, disappear, and yet at the and so. You know, that to me is, it's kind of like the problem statement. And then the solution is in this King David's encounter with God. And what it says there is that, you know, it says about the, the video game. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, so to me, it's kind of relating back to, you know, it's, it's like saying, okay, the problem that you know the reason the mystical experience didn't complete is is this video game aspect and it's like and it could be it could actually relate back to to the children although i don't quite see how yet yeah i mean that, that's the two choices you got is either the children are the um are the are the redeeming thing or they're the childish aspect of ourselves. And, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I, I'm not, I'm leaning towards Ivan's theory. What do you think, Roy? Yeah, I'm, I'm always left field. I can't help it. Yes, that's I'm going to go with the children are the redeeming thing. If, if Charles came up with, uh, the, a pain body in his dream, I might change it. But to my knowledge, he hasn't come up with a pain body. So uh, I'll probably have the same problem that Charles has, but I have a pain body, so I kind of understand it. But I consider the children sacred. And I, I consider they're being brainwashed. And so when uh, Charles changed the, uh, the curriculum, they, they get real nervous and start disappearing because they're kind of brainwashed and Sunday schools at worst at that. And then I link it to uh, King David. Well, that's Sunday school. Uh, and the video games, well, that's where we're brainwashed again with the video games because King David, he was just a child, 12 years old or something. He was just a child. He slew a giant. He slew a damn giant. He was just a child. There was no video game. You know, if, if he, if he thought he had a chance of losing or, or if he didn't have that child courage, you know, not seeing danger, he couldn't have done such a feat. I mean, that was his, that really put him on the map. And then the unconditional love, only a child can understand that. You know, an adult count. This dream's about brainwashing, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I, I, I'm with Charles. I think I think Charles really picks up on that. I'm really happy to see a millennium, you know, make a statement like that about video games. You know, left field here, take it. 
No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like I say, I'm torn between those two. And uh, um, the thing is that the Sunday school aspect of it, and then it's linked to King David. And then um, it's just like this. Um, the, the, this book of King David turns into the, this book of the video games, uh, uh, video games, and, they, and then there's a voice, and it makes four statements. Number one is, video games should not be played. Number two is, it causes the situation to become more and more chaotic. And number three is, it increases your chance of losing because it becomes more and more chaotic. The situation, whatever that is. And then the fourth statement, which follows, is, um, is so the video game should not be played. What should you do? Pure, unconditional love is the key. Now, we don't, I think we'll talk about that in a bit, but I don't think we should look at that as, as agape Christian love. I think it's a different kind of love. What do you think, Ivan? I'm really interested in the the King David's encounters with her encounter, singular, right? Encounter with God. Yes. Um, I, I think there's a big key there because I, I, I'm thinking that that has something to, I don't know much about the Bible. I was just reading now about King David. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, it seems to me like a reminder of, of humility, right? Is, is maybe how I would take that. Like generally, most of the things I see that are encounters with God are kind of a reminder of there's something larger and more important than yourself. You must humble yourself to that. And then this book transforms into a video describing about video games. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like there's like... Uh, it, it seems like the contents of this book are actually being displayed to us in some way. Um, maybe not literally, but in, in this metaphor. Uh, so that, that's what I'm most interested in the stream at this point. Yeah. And the, the thing we got to focus on is who is speaking here. It is the book King David's encounter with God. And it makes those four statements. Okay. Uh, how about you, Sarah? You've been on a roll here. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't really have anything else to add than what I said last time right now. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of want to soak in what you guys are saying, really. Could you it. refresh us our memory of what you said? Um, yeah, I had it written down, too. Um, it was kind of like um, how the mystical spirit, uh, experience was almost trying to go through a transformation um and the super consciousness is involved and is watching um making you know the um the um aspects of yourself that are immature uncomfortable um and then the exterior information or stimulation with the video games like searching for um exterior things to give you what you're looking for or they're really just taking you away from what you're trying to find. Um, and it's too chaotic. It'll lead you astray. So you need to go inward. That's what I was saying about that. And then the pure unconditional love is the goal and the key. Um, for some reason, I just feel like that's something that you already know, that maybe that's something that you're already going for and trying to understand and comprehend, maybe. Yeah. Well, that's very good. I would say, too, um, I would say the last statement, pure, unconditional love is the key. I mean, it's essentially a relationship with, with the center, you know. And I think when we say pure, unconditional love, I think it means not, it, it's not a moral thing. It's um, not a, uh, it can't be just feeling functioned, unless it's talking about the feeling function. Uh, Charles, what is your dominant uh, type? You know, uh, introverted, intuitive. I I guess. Okay. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Well, there's an aspect of you that's thinking, 
because uh, you know, seem to know a lot about uh, science, you know. But uh, I would say that, that the key, typically, in this kind of stuff, is going to be um, is going to be uh, uh, you, you you know uh, assimilating, having the unconscious become and the ego uh, be c closer to the middle of plane, so the center comes close to the middle pain, pain and the center of gravity of ego comes to, uh, closer to the middle plane. And this is the work of Hermes, okay? The messenger between the two worlds brings them closer together, you know? So that's, that's the hermetic uh, task, you know? And that is usually the key. But I think when they say pure unconditional love is the key, if you were going to identify that with a function, it would be with two things. It would either be with the feeling function, and I think this is what it is, has to do with, though, is eros. Okay, what is eros? Okay, eros is, is this, um, the aspect of bringing things together, um, of relatedness, okay? Now you you have mentioned to me, Charles, um, this aspect of feeling very isolated um, and alone sometimes. So what is the key? Eros, you know, bringing things together. So this is not the logos world. What is the key here is is really um, the the uh, the this wonderful uh, aspect of of um, the lunar consciousness that brings things together. And we're all, um, you know, Eros had something to do with there is an unbreakable cord between you and life and everyone around you uh, that was originally represented by the umbilical cord. And it was like this tie of blood because it's very fleshly, you know, Eros cannot exist without the body, okay? The Logos is way uh, past the body, but Eros has to do with our bodies and with our relating to other bodies while we're alive, you know? I don't know what you could say about Eros after you're dead, okay? But um, while we're alive, it's, it's, the, it's the principle of life. You know, and it's, um, so I think that's what that has to do with, with that. Um, video games net should not be played. And I think this, this has to do with um, this aspect of a artificial reality, okay? This artificial reality that we're leaving just causes our essence of being a, a living being to become more and more chaotic and this would be these feelings of isolation these feelings of disorientation being lost not having your two feet on the ground and it increases your chance of losing now i think in here losing would be a sense of uh of uh of losing energy and, and it would be, um, you know, sometimes that we've been, uh, you've been experiencing some aspects of, uh, which we all experience at one time or another, of, um, and Jung said this was the primary problem with all of his patients, most of his patients, was laziness and apathy. And the fact that they took things for granted, this, uh, you, you know, they'd have this fabulous vision and they'd just sit there almost half asleep. Most people, if they had that vision, they would, you know, explode in a cloud of light. Okay. And uh, um, now I'm, I've been pontificating here. Carl, do you have any comments? Yeah. Um, okay. So I would, you know, it's kind of related to what everyone else said, but a few things. Um, Sunday school, church, uh, you know, that's, 
I've heard it mentioned many places, you know, people go to church to avoid real spiritual experience, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard people talking about the burning bush. Um, this older person was talking about it. I write in my Christian book by so-and-so. So, uh, so -so. Everyone knew who this guy author was. I had no idea. And take and he's saying, take time to look at the burning bush. And then he gives this maudlin smile. You know, it's like Jesus, God is your buddy sort of thing. If you're having encounters with a self, if you're having mystical experiences, it's not take time to look at the burning bush. It has you. You, you, you are, you are, a, you know, on holy ground and, and you're in awe, like approaching terror. Um, the kids in the Sunday school, those who are brainwashed, don't want anything to do with that. You know, they want to hear about when they go to heaven and, and, and get a mansion or something. So, um, there's that, uh, King David, you know, uh, I can't remember a ton about him at the moment, except he's father of, of Solomon. Uh, Saul tried to kill him. Um, he's from, you know, Jesus was descended from him. Um, we were talking about he was young, you know, he's a kid when he killed Goliath. And uh, when you're a kid, you're, your logos isn't very developed, like you were saying, and you just do it. And often that's, that's where, you know, that's, that's really where the magic in life is when you just do it and when you're in a flow state. Um, for instance, the other day I was at outside of a, a big Home Depot and there's a little drain pipe way up on the top of the roof. And my girlfriend's visiting. She's never seen snow. She's from Columbia. I made a snowball and it was like 50 feet up there. And I just chucked it at that little hole. Wasn't thinking. I wanted to get it in it, but I wasn't really trying. And just went whoop, right through that little drain pipe. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that really happened right now? Like if I try, if I really tried to do that, I can't do that. But I just was like, eh, disappeared. So that's basically what I got on that. Um, yeah. It kind of reminds me in, in Twin Peaks, you know, when Agent Cooper wanted to find the right answer uh, to who, uh, to a clue, he would throw rocks at a bottle. Yes. You know, somebody would name uh, some clue and he'd throw a rock at a bottle and it would not hit it. And then yep. they'd name the next clue. And finally, when he hit the the right clue, that he just smashes it. Up. You know, I I think I'm a intuitive. Um, well, I'm an INFP. And I think I've tried to live too much by logos and other people's standards for too long. And I think I just have to just... I don't know, just be more like, you know, young David, basically. Well, that's the path of most men, uh, that they are, um, are, are rootless and in need of the earth and grounded. They are um, just floating beings. You know, there are not very many men who are, usually they'd be a sensate, you know, uh, an extroverted sensate or something like that that would be um, almost automatically rooted, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, one other thing I'd like to say about King David is he's also kind of represents the hero journey because, I mean, his, his task of killing this behemoth um, is very similar to what Gilgamesh did, you know. I mean, they have to kill the monster. Uh, and uh, this really represents a, a, a real important Id image in alchemy that the only way that we can have a relationship with the psyche is to kill that beastly aspect of it um, and uh, after we've killed the be beastly aspect of it there's going to be a rebirth and now it's going to be more human-like you know it's going to be not a dragon it will be an elk you know, and, uh, you know, it gradually will, will evolve. And also, of course, there's the hero journey, uh, 
uh, that we're all supposed to live is, uh, you know, which is this cycle of, uh, of uh, it's uh, what the hero journey really is in dreams. You start at the high school or your grandparents' house or, you know, your own house when you're a child and, and you, you go in a circle and then you come back to the starting point and then you have to start again. But that's the idea is, is you're going on a circular adventure and what are you going to learn? What are you going to attain on this journey? Because what you're really doing in that circular motion is creating a world, you know. Um, you, you are creating a world when you um, go on this journey, you know. And King David was kind of a, a you know, rep represented, uh, uh, you, you know, rather than being appointed king like Saul, he was, um, he, he became king just because of his uh, heroic qualities. Well, now, okay, let's, Charles, um, I saw that you were resonating with some of the things. Why do, what, what, are, what are your current feelings about this? Oh, wait a second, Dawn. I just want to say, Dawn, I'll, I'll, if you ever, um, one thing you can help us with is just uh, if this was your dream, um, what would you think? Now, you know, you can just put it in the text or something, but just say, this is, you know, I'm Dawn. This is my dream. This is what, um, this is just a, my first impressions of the dream. You don't have to get too deep on it, but. Um, anyway, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of, pretty much every said, everyone said at least one thing that really resonated. I um, uh, loved everything Roy said, uh, per usual. Um, but uh, Carl said something that was, well, I mean, this was mentioned by multiple people, but like, I, I think this, this dream is extremely personal and um, it is, it is talking about my personal mystical experience that I had. And I've had a lot of dreams where like one of the dreams I actually brought to a session one time where I, I was like laying in the bed in the uh, classroom and like I had a dream recreation of a mystical experience that I had, like that's the one I was talking about. Um, and, you know, it's talking about me and my mystical experience and that I am, huh, and this is an older dream, but I was on the verge of having one and that I see the children as chances to learn and that my, every time I get, become afraid because my mystical experience was the most loving experience I've ever had in my entire life. And when it happened to me, I felt like a child. I literally felt like I had just been born again and everything was brand new. I remember very specifically when I laid down to go to bed that night, it was the first time I had ever laid in a bed. It was the very first, it was the very first time I'd ever laid down to go to sleep. It was the most incredible thing that I had ever experienced. And it was pure love, pure unconditional love. And I say unconditional because of all the messed up things that I've done to myself in my life, all the things that if I were to have done to someone else, that they would have right to call me evil. Um, all those things that I'd done, uh, I was still, for whatever reason, I was still able to have this experience. And it was extremely terrifying because uh, I almost had it again about a month later and it feels like you're involuntarily leaving your body and it just happens out of nowhere. So I'm just like, yeah, I really, I just, I was like, I do not feel like leaving my body right now. I swore, I promised God, I'm like, look, just not right now, please, not right now, anything, anything. And I just, didn't happen, I suppressed it, but I laid there convulsing in my bed for half an hour. Uh, it's extremely, extremely powerful. It, have every every single cell in my body experienced it it wasn't just a vision it wasn't a psychic experience it was my whole being from head to toe inside and out 
um, completely gone and then came back reborn uh, in pure unconditional love. And I think in the dream, you know, I'm losing chances to learn again. I'm, I, every time the child leaves, you know, I'm losing a chance to learn. And then I'm down to very few chances. And, and it says, well, hold on. Okay, you're running out of chances. Let me give you some instruction. Like, let I, here's like, the book. Right, right. Um, let me try to explain to you how important this is and what's going on. And um, I think the idea about, I mean, the, still the thing about video games is really weird. I mean, the psyche could have put it some other way, but the video games, I guess, you know, I, there's a video game that I have right now that I have 2,600 hours logged on. And like, I'll tell you what, it could have been, the time could have been spent doing something, you know, much more fruitful, uh, obviously. And um, I do feel like they particularly mm, like mess with your mind in a very, very specific way. Um, and I guess the psyche would describe it as more chaotic. And I think saying that it, increases your chance of losing it was trying to use video game lingo was what it was trying to yes, do that it was you, trying to your yeah you're not going to accomplish the task right it, right it, I there's won't, no yeah um but yeah it was just trying to use video game language and it was trying to remind me remember like pure unconditional love is what you're going after not not victory or like technical things I, I don't know um but um i think um that's what i think this dream was talking about i think i see the children as like brand new chances for me to like to learn it's a you know they're all students they're not just children they're all they were all sitting there studying something reading whatever yeah in, in a in yeah. a in a sacred timonos. Mm -hmm. So you have the, all these, uh, these chances to learn who are gathered in the temple of wisdom. Okay. And it, it sort of reminds me of um, the, the mystical experience where you're missing the chances to learn. They're learning. This is a place of learning. This is, that's something we missed you know, or I missed, <laughs> you, you're in this place of learning uh, and they're learning. And uh, it's this sacred team in us. So it's, this is our opportunities to learn. Okay. Now, um, what, what the um, idea is, I think that we don't get the message of the mystical experience correctly. Now, um, or like you said, you're terrified of it because you don't have Carl's dam. You know, Carl's anima very um, graciously provides him with a dam that will control the flow of the unconscious into uh, our, our awareness. In your case, I think you're almost saying, I don't have a damn. That whole thing's going to flood into me. And, I, I, and I'm a little frightened by it. Okay. And it also um, reminds me of, um, you know, when Black Elk had his vision, he didn't tell anybody about it for about 25 years. Yet, what happened to him is he lived in total fear that whole time because every time there would be thunder, the thunder had a voice that was condemning him for his um, not presenting this uh, vision to, uh, you know, to the local shaman who, in, after he heard it, immediately knew that this was something that was very important. But um, that, so the video games, 
Now, I think the video games is something that, you, you know, I, I would just seeing young uh, saying, uh, you, you know, whenever you have a house dream, you know, um, it, 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 it's kind of our outer skin or there's an aspect of it that's, and he says it has, originally we lived in tents, you know, so this is a more, uh, 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 you know, amplified version of the tent. And in fact, it has a cellar, it has a, uh, the depth, the, uh, the underground world, and it has an attic, you know, and it has the middle. So um, I think it, the psyche, well, or the dream maker, is going to take whatever is handy and what is important to us. Like, for instance, you wouldn't have no video game dreams uh, back before the turn of the century, but it's, it is taking this aspect which is really an addictive, almost an addictive thing, you know? And it's saying um, that it, it just separates, like you said, it does this weird thing about our brains. It separates us from, from the inexhaustible joy of being alive. You know, this aspect of being alive, you know, uh, is just incredible, you know? Um, that uh, we are rocks who've come alive. We are a, we are the same material you find in a rock that has been assembled into something and we're walking around. We can see, we can hear, we've got grammar, we talk, yet we take it all for granted. You know, like we almost fall asleep, we're so bored, you know. And uh, so, and then like you say, it um, increases your chance of losing. And so if we compare your existence to a computer game, and this is the voice of the book, King David's Encounter with God. And what is it saying? It's saying that um, that video game should not be played. In other words, anything you're doing that doesn't serve the 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 individual individuation process, which means not to be broken up anymore, to end of undivided is what individuation means. It means to not be broken anymore. The the um, anything that we do in our ego life that does not um, make us less broken, just makes us more chaotic, and it increase, increases our chance of never being whole. And I think in your case, the key is love, okay? It's the love you experienced in your um, initiation vision, which is what you had, and also a, a feeling that um, you, you um, it seems to me that the primary value in your life is, um, is, relatedness eros and love i mean you've told me this yourself i mean what what's what you're really looking for is um to be connected to the earth through uh, a family and through children and whatever you know i mean that kind of an aspect and so um this this psyche is very compassionately uh explaining to us something after you um, missed all these learning uh, uh, opportunities, they left you because you're afraid and you don't know what to do with the with the with what the psyche sends you, uh, and so you miss all you, there are all these unopened letters. Okay, that's what Young called it. When you get a get some kind of a vision and you don't do anything with it, it's like you got you have a bunch of letters sitting on your desk with very beautiful handwriting in it from uh from the the dark stranger from across the sea who is probably just saying fascinating things in that letter which would absolutely pull us <coughs> into life and yet we don't open any of them you know uh <coughs> anyway um Roy, uh, why don't you go? I'm going to take a throw out some beer.
Uh, well, yeah, that, you said a lot of good stuff, Craig. Uh, I, I guess the bottom line for me is uh, this last thing, the pure unconditional love is the goal key. Well, you know, you got to experience that in a dream, Charles. You got to experience that. You got to feel that. But you can't expect the external world that's going to happen. I mean, if it does, it's like grace. That's wonderful. But you can't make it happen. You can't expect it to happen. You still have to get out there and live life. You know, young is all about living your life. You know, that's, that's where it's at. And, and you might experience, and experience unconditional love in the external world. You don't know until you do it. But you can't put that as a condition first. You know, you have to put yourself out there first. It takes courage. It takes courage, just like King David. King David meets God. It's just like that. That's what it takes. The heart. You can do it. It's worth it. A very strong actor. A very active being, King David. Very, very strong actor. Sarah, have you have any additional thoughts um, or um, I just had more of a question for Charles. Um, I'm just curious how much time you do get in nature um, and outside, you know, with, you know, with trees and flowers and grass and the sand beneath your feet. Well, um, not the sand. I live in the Midwest, but um, uh, in spring and summer in uh, good weather, I, there's like a trail that I walk all the time. But yeah, in this weather, I I it's I take hard, walks, right? but it's just in like it's in my town. It's not really nature yeah. at all. I live in a somewhat industrial right. industrial commercial area, so yeah, not not a yeah, whole lot. Because to me, like the video games, are, video games are almost opposite of nature. Like it's mm -hmm. to me, it's almost disturbing. Cause like um, after I started going through my experiences and my awakenings or whatever you would call it um it's i can't even be in a room with a video game anymore like i have to leave the room like just watch everybody staring at the tv instead of staring at each other it like almost makes me want to cry like see people playing video games together they think that they're spending quality time together and they're not even looking at each other in their eyes or like at, in their faces you know like to me like it takes you away from what's real it takes you away from from love it takes you away from what you're searching for especially when you're searching for something you know more than the physical for sure um to me like um grounding and getting into nature is extremely healing and there's a lot of love that you can get from nature itself definitely and healing too. Very spiritual, yeah. It's it's a great impoverishment of of the modern world is that we are so separated from nature. You know, I mean, uh, Marie Lee's and Franz described it um, of 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 the morning of dawn and and the uh, uh, rising of the sun. You know, of of the noonday of the relationship with the plant world, the tree world, the flower world, of the relationship with, with animals, you know, the, uh, the cow, the, uh, you, know, you know, the horse, uh, and then the, um, uh, the sunset, and then the mm -hmm. long night, and we have no electricity, no music, no television, know anything we sat and just endured this um magic of night you know uh, which the is the sounds that you hear when you're in the forest the sounds of the animals and the birds and the leaves and like the branches creaking and everything if you just sit out there you almost lose yourself oh. you, you almost become invisible you're just part of it and then you remember that you really aren't separate you really are just part of this earth. Like we've separated ourselves. Humans have separated themselves. You know, we think we're something higher or separate from the earth, but that is really just taking something from us. That's so important. You know, we've lost that. And I think that's part of what we're searching for is to become connected again. 
you know, well, there's, higher, there's higher realms we're trying to become connected to, but also the earth as well. Like uh, humans are now in this we weird, like disconnected floaty space and we're reaching for something more down into the earth and up above as well. It's absolutely delicious. You know, I've, sat one time and they were wanted us to do an act of imagination outside and so i sat under a tree and uh, i hadn't sat under a tree for so long you know and i was hearing all those things you heard sarah but i was also watching the clouds go by and i i'd feel a a just a, a light gentle breeze that would you know tossle your hair or, or blow uh your collar a little bit you know, and, uh, and just sitting in the sun or, or sitting in the shade, you know. And, you know, the, and then the other thing is the change of seasons, you know, from spring and summer. Fall, fall is so beautiful. And uh, then the, um, the, the grayness and the brownness of winter, you know, uh, which is when Persephone has to go into the underworld you know, which is a symbol to us, including the most, uh, uh, you know, I always wanted to make, I, I, I always would tell people that I want to make every day as if it's Christmas Eve. You know, I want every moment to be as if it's Christmas Eve, you know, filled with the expectation of, of, of out of the night, comes this wonderful starlight you know and this this is what i'm to hoping to go ahead it's hard it's hard to do when you're always constantly overly stimulated you know yes. by video games and television you're always like so overly stimulated that you don't know what to do when you're not anymore and you have a hard time feeling and observing all the things that are so beautiful around you that you just they don't even seem to matter anymore. They're, it's not even there. You don't see it anymore. You can't, um, you can't read its language anymore. You know, like. Yeah, it seems, it seems to make the, the moments less boring, but actually it's this great impoverishment. You know, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm in my uh, active imaginations, I'm just appalled at where my awareness is at. You know, I say, oh my God, you know, drop that, fall, sink from that. And then, then I go to another level and I still feel it's, it's pain and it's jaggedness of, the, of, of ego consciousness. And I try to get rid of that, you know, and it's very difficult for me to get rid of the jaggedness of ego consciousness, you know, which is, is not friendly to the center, you know, at all, you know, but, um, and I'm, that's what I'm hoping to do with the telescope anyway, is to reacquaint myself with the night sky. What do you think, Gary? I think it's already been said really well, so I'm not gonna add anything. Okay, great. Uh, Ivan, do you have any comments? And No, it's a really nice, really okay. nice discussion. I don't have anything to add though. Yeah, how about you, Carl? Oh, Carl. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nothing to add, really. I think everyone's. Um, I can can't really add to what's been said at this point. Yeah. Well, uh, you know the one thing, uh, and Dawn, of course, just anything you ever want to say, you can just put it in the text. But you know, all, I, I think any of us, no matter whether we're great amplifiers or not, can can uh, uh, relate to something. If I had that dream, ooh. What would my what would be the over the first emotion that I incur? Um, uh, anyway, you, you know the one thing that I experience through amplifying this stream is is the um, poignant humanness of it. Remember, we start out really theoretical, and then it becomes more and more real to the. Uh, to the existence uh, that we have, you know, the, the living aspects of ourselves. You know, I mean, I, I just had this feeling of that the whole time we were talking, is it went from the abstract and theoretical into uh, 
what Martin Buber, you know, used to say, when I die, I don't want to die with a book in my hand. I want to have it someone holding my hand. And I think a, a lot of the things Charles said um, kind of took the scales from my eyes and let me see um, uh, our, our own humanity, not just Charles's, but our own humanity. Charles, do you have any um, closing comments? Because I, I never feel that we ever finish with a dream. Um, uh, but because uh, I, I mean, I, the ne I it just, I will have more to say about it tomorrow. I think the only, there's one thing that I forgot to mention, um, and that was inspired by what Roy and Carl said that, like, and, uh, and what Ivan said, uh, that, like, I need to actually, you know, it, it's it, the, the experience that I had was so utterly preposterous and. I don't ever expect, I know no one will understand it. And I don't expect anyone to even believe me when I describe it. But yet, it seems to be almost like the fundamental highlight of my life story. And I have to be almost, I have to have almost the bravery and naivety of a child in order to live by it because mm -hmm. of the sheer preposterous unbelievable nature of it i am so concerned about you know if i were to really live by that experience it and incorporate it into my myth i i don't even know what would happen or where that would take me or what people would think of me but i just have to be i just have to have that childlike attitude towards like you know it'll be fun <laughs> you know and uh i think that's the approach that i need to take i can't think about it my thinking isn't gonna really do a whole lot i just have to sort of do it Wait, well you know the one thing i just uh, mentioned what i uh, thought about um uh, the feeling i had when you described your vision was this of of this man who um you know vishnu sleeps on the cosmic serpent that floats on the ocean of milk. And his wife, uh, Lakshmi, uh, massages his calf. And from that, he dreams the dream of the universe, okay? He dreams the dream, we are his dream, you know? But this man accidentally strays too close to his mouth and falls out. And he, and he sees Vishnu lying there, dreaming the dream of the universe. Okay, well, he's got to go back. He can't be out here. So Vishnu puts him back in his mouth. Okay, so now um, this is very similar to a shaman experience. You know, the shaman, they take the shaman out to the igloo uh, out in the wilderness and they wall him in it with a little bit of food and he's supposed to just sit there for 30 days and 30 nights. Wow. And that's his initiation. And what he says is something like this, you know, he says, he says, I want to tell you, I died many times out there. And he says, but I found and learned what can only be learned and found in the stillness, in the wilderness. He says, the voice of nature itself spoke to me. And it, um, it sometimes sounded like children's voices and sometimes sounded like falling snow. And it spoke with a motherly solicitude. And it says, said to me, do not be afraid of life. Live life, you know. So now he goes back, and don't be afraid of the universe either. Goes back to the, and this is the, this is the meaning of the night sea journey. You know, uh, people would see the sun go down in the west at night and uh, under the uh, uh, ocean, 
you know, go down into the ocean. What, what happened? Where's it going? And then they see it come up over here in the morning. What happened all the time it was gone? I mean, nobody knew that the earth was round and that it rotated around a, a star. So they, there's all these images of, of our light goes into the, uh, into the depths and then uh, it comes up. So the night sea journey is where you go down. The ego is broken up in a million pieces. It's put back together and it comes out the other end. And now it is um, ready for life. But it has this, this inner experience, which it will never forget. So, I mean, I think that's the aspect, Charles, that, um, that is this, this vision needs to be incorporated in your earthly, fleshly life in, uh, as a living being. And how do you do it, you know, is the, is the question. Um, that's sort of not exactly a helpful uh, advice, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's easy to say, harder to do. Roy, did you have any closing uh, comments? And then we'll go to Ivan's stream. Or Charles, you can say I, I, re I really believe Charles gets it. Charles knows. He knows. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I, I do think um, that this is, like he says, an intensely personal dream. But I think, um, yeah, I think at least it's going to, we're going to incubate it. Don't you think, Charles? going to be a little incubating. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, there's, yeah. there's bound to be some more nuances that we can pick up. I still, I still even, th I have a good idea of what the children are, but I, th I think it is even more complex, or there's just more to it than some new chances to learn. It's, I think there's, and the cryptic statement by the book, I think, you know, that could be unraveled more. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely more uh, to gain through incubation for well, sure. Yeah, it's not really new chances to learn if we're going to use the children. It's it is the growing thing. You know, life is a becoming thing, and if life is not becoming, it's dead. Slay a real giant. Slay a real giant. Yeah, right. What what is this? What is this monster in you that's holding you back? You need. You need to take a sling and you need to go like this and throw <laughs> it and kill it so that now life can begin, you know? I mean, there's something in you that needs to be killed because it's, it is, um, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's seemingly overwhelming power is clouding everything. And until it's killed, life can't go on. If you're living with this, this malevolent giant, you know, nothing can happen, you know. So what in, in, in this is of this malevolent giant that, that is, uh, is, is um, uh, you, you know, impeding an, uh, an obstacle to, to life itself, you know, what is that? Well, anyway, um, let's think about it. Maybe we'll have some more think thoughts Monday. But Ivan, uh, why don't you? Uh, we don't have much time, but I'm sorry. But we'll you'll be totally donated or time next time, and then Gary, you're up after that. Okay, Ivan, go ahead. You... Sure, uh, I'm just posting the the dream into the chat here. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so I called this dream shackles. So uh, I'm an old beaten down car. It's like kind of, it's yellow or green. From what I remember, it's, it's like boxy sort of 80s style, you know, like think like a Volvo or something like that, like an old one. And uh, next to me in the passenger seat is a man in shackles. Oh, it's on the fourth floor of a parking lot. So like it, it's dark, it's at night. It's, I think the weather is snowy outside. Um, and uh, so next to me in the, pa we're parked and next to me in the passenger seat is a man in shackles. And my daughter is in the back seat. It's not my, like my daughter in real life. My daughter in real life is like five years old in this dream, she's like 12. Um, so the man in shackles is a friend of mine, but I'm turning him in for some unknown reason. 
My daughter frees this man from his shackles and he is escaping through the parking garage. He races down a stairwell with many people. I try to catch him. I'm yelling, stop this man, he is a fugitive. Uh, but the people on the stairs seem dis disinterested and he escapes. So there's a lot of people on the stairs too. So he's, he's headed towards somewhere like with a lot of people. I don't know where this parking garage is. So this is, that's the first part of the dream. The second part of the dream I'm not in, I'm just kind of seeing it as an observer from up high. And I, I see this, uh, this fugitive and he's hiding during a blizzard in a rundown house and, and the roof doesn't work. And so there's just snow accumulating inside of it. Um, he appears to be freezing um, and he has snow up to his waist. He's drinking from a large water bottle. Uh, I see him drinking from this water bottle and he grimaces. It appears to be filled with an unpleasant liquid. And so that's the, that's the dream. Okay, now, uh, did you put in the per part about after he escapes? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. Later I see the future. Okay. All right, well, let's get going on this. I mean, we'll at least get it a start. Um, I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna say too much about it because I'd like to hear what everybody has to say. Uh, okay, you're an old, now this is a, a recurring image um, in uh, Ivan's dreams. It's, it's some, uh, it's sort of an, uh, not a real antique car, but it's a dated car. And uh, it's on the fourth floor of a parking lot. Okay. Well, it's a, at the, uh, you, you know, yeah, it's, this would be it's a parking a, garage, not a parking garage. Yeah, parking lot. garage, parking garage. Well, it, you know, it, that's very significant that it's on the fourth floor. And next to me on the passenger seat is a man in shackles my daughter's in the back seat, except she looks age 12-ish in the stream. So she's older than she normally is, right? So she's near adulthood. So she's more of a younger anima or a growing aspect of ourselves. Um, and you see the prison man in shackles. So we don't know who he is yet. Uh, the man in shackles is a friend of mine, but I'm turning him in for some unknown reason. My daughter frees the man from the shackles, the anima, the young anima, frees the shadow, and he escapes from the fourth floor of the parking garage, and then he descends with uh, with many other people, and you are now trying to catch this uh, shadow aspect of us. He's a fugitive. Okay, this is so beautiful, but the people on the stairs seem disinterested and he escapes. Later, I see the fugitive in my dream, but now it's uh, as an observer. He's, uh, so, so you're almost seeing it from above, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the dream ego is not really there, but you're just seeing him, and he's hiding during a blizzard in a uh, rundown house with snow up to his waist. In the, in the run, rundown house, the, there was snow inside the rooms? Yeah. Yeah, the, like the roof yeah. has. You know. All right. And uh, it, he, he's drinking from a large water bottle. So he's drinking from the water. You see him drinking from this and he grimaces it. Oh, this is so beautiful. I mean, this is going to take a while. Uh, how about you, Charles? What do you think? I mean, it's a beautiful dream. Let me just say that. Go ahead. I, my first uh, impression was like, so... I, I, I see the guy in the shackles as the shadow, but like, I think the idea that you're turning him in has something to do with also the crowd. Like, I think it's almost like um, you're, you're, you're like hoping or expecting that like, you can almost like rid of, or deal with the shadow by the collective. Like you're, you know, you're, someone gets turned in because they committed a crime against society. If there weren't any society or collective things, like there wouldn't be any like law. Um, and so you want to like deal with the shadow by turning him into the collective. And the animal's just like, that's not going to work. Like that, uh, you like, you, you need another attempt at this. So let me just send him back down into the depths. Uh, because you need to deal with this individually 
and that's why the group or the people in the stairwell don't care at all um it's almost like you know it's like the in reality the collective can't see your shadow like that's it's your own personal figure um and uh i think there was something else i was gonna say um but that's that's kind of my first impression of it and that um then just the, later the shadow just being in rough rough shape um you know like when i when i it pictured in my head i'm like that is someone that is possibly going to die really soon um they don't even have proper water it's maybe like i mean my first impression was like might not have been water it might have been uh, like vodka or something it might have just looked like water um it's, it just seems like a really really rough shadow figure that's like in dire circumstances that you know he escapes from his escapes from captivity and um he's like oh this uh horrible rundown house in the middle of this blizzard's better than better than being in chains um it's 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 uh striking and odd uh picture of the shadow to me but yeah that's my first impression yeah, waist deep in the frozen unconscious with no uh heat or warmth of human 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 um life in it and this the and before he was in shackles what do you think roy Oh, you're muted. I think you were unmuted. Yeah, man. there you go. Coming in from left field. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think Ivan knows who this guy is. Uh, it seems like the anima and the shadow in cahoots. Man, we, we don't like that in a dream. There's trouble brewing. I think Ivan knows who this guy is. Could it be Adequa? Could it be the green man? Uh, the, the, the little girl freezing, you know, they're in cahoots. Oh yeah, this is big time. You gotta solve this mystery. Yeah, you need this guy. He, I don't know if it's your pain body or your, the green man, the shadow animal, cahoots. You gotta connect up with this guy. Yeah, you've been really neglecting him. He, he's a mess. Yeah, yeah there, this, this is a very mysterious, I mean, this, this is again a dream that I think if we spent about 60 minutes on like we did with Charles, <laughs> we're really gonna get somewhere. How about you, Sarah? What do you think? I have to let this one sink in a little bit. Okay. Good I don't really you. have anything to say right here. Yeah. Well, I like uh, you're, you. You you're very. Um, yeah, I like that uh, attitude. I want to. Uh, to uh, I mean, you take it seriously. You know, I I think it's funny when you get in here. You get sort of dizzy after doing this for a while. It's. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's, it's, 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 we start to speak the language. What do you think, Gary? I find the blizzard interesting because he go, you know, you go from, uh, you know, the parking lot to this intense blizzard in a rundown house. You know, a psyche in trouble. And then snow up to his waist. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is something in dire straits. So, but drinking from a large water bottle, I mean, water is, is, is sort of like a, you know, is generally sort of an essence of life in, in a dream. So it's like there's this attempt to survive, but even, even the attempt to survive is unpleasant um yeah i like i like what roy had to say you know this is this is a mystery that needs to be solved and you may know who this is that's, yeah. that's all i have well yeah what's interesting about it is uh let's just go from the fugitive or from the man in shackles with the anima the anima releases him uh he 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 makes a descent from the fourth floor 
So he goes down into the depths and then um, he's in a frozen wasteland of the unconscious, drinking uh, like the water bearer, drinking uh, uh, the, the uh, realm of images there. You know, but it's, um, uh, we, this is going to be, uh, take us a while. What do you think, Carl? Um, I liked what Charles said. And I mean, that's, and what your, someone was just saying about the, uh, well, I, everything everyone's saying basically is all I really have. <laughs> I mean, I was just blown away at first by it. And it's, it's a great dream, and uh, but I think everyone's really, you know, connecting so far. So I don't have anything else to add, really. It, it makes me wonder about my own. I mean, both of these dreams make me wonder about my own situations a lot too. So, um, so I guess that's how we figure these things out, for one thing. I guess, right? So you know, our own experiences and being human. But I like what everyone's saying. Uh, you know, there, there's a dream and visions where this woman is sitting in her bed reading and uh, a, uh, um, on a second story and uh, some woman climbs in the window and, and says to her, don't you know that your house is on fire? And uh, she says, no, it's very quiet here in this room, you know. What what Young is saying here is, um, what you, you, you know, um, the aspect of the um, the door is locked. The woman comes in through the window. He says to to we all sh always should look at this as if it's really happening to us right now. And what do we think if this really happened? You know, so. Um, you know, we're in this, uh, let's just go over it real quickly. I, 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 I'll just review it real quick. And um, unless uh, Roy or, or uh, anybody has any comments. Okay, uh, let's go through each image separately because we kind of went too, too fast. You're in the old beaten down car, yellow or green. Okay, so it's, um, you know, yellow would be intuition, green is sensation. Okay, it's it's a um, sort of an antiquated way of getting around. So it has a, it's a venerable quality. So we're in a vehicle uh, of a venerable quality, and uh, they always uh, have something to say. And it's an '80s style, and it's on the fourth floor of a parking lot. So it's not on the third floor. It's not on the first floor. It's on the fourth floor. So this means that there is the parking garage itself is a representative of the four okay and we happen to be at the um in the upper realms of the of wholeness you know so uh in this case it's probably in the dominant function i'm guessing because it's the one that's closest to consciousness uh, all the rest of them, to go into any of them, is a descent into the unconscious, okay? So we're in the, probably, I would say, into the, in the dominant function. Ivan, um, your dominant function is thinking, is that right or not? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, you're like, would be an INTP, possibly? I think I'm INTJ. INTJ. Well, I'm an INTJ, but then that would make my intuitive the dominant. You know, INTP, the thinking would be dominant. But anyway, we're in the dominant function, and there uh, we're in this vehicle, which is seemingly representing sensation and intuition. So sensation and intuition are the um, yellow and green, you know, represent sort of the um uh the what they call them the perceiving functions but they're the ones that just happen to us we have no control over them they just occur you know we we can't really use them that consciously like we can thinking and feeling which are more related to the ego world so it seems it's a more natural like a green car like the green man 
or a yellow car, which would be like a this yellow flower or something like that. And uh, then on the passenger seat is a man in shackles, the man in shackles, okay? The man who is uh, in chains, who sits next to us, you know, in this, um, this older vehicle, which I think we need to, to wrap our heads around what <coughs> its color and its age. <coughs> and then um, the anima is in the back seat in the, in the more unconscious part of this vehicle. And uh, uh, she's um, a young anima, not quite, uh, so she's a growing thing. <coughs> Now the man of shackles is our acquaintance, but he's committed some. Um, he, he has committed some act that um, is offensive to uh, the ego world. Maybe not just to our ego, but to the ego world, and uh, um, we need to turn him in. Um, but we don't know the reason. So it's the, he has committed the unknown sin, <laughs> a sin that's unknown to us. Now, so now the anima is looking at this and say, it's not, this is not just. You're, the ego is committing an injustice. So she uh, frees um, the, uh, uh, the man in shackles. My father always gets really mad because he sets out chipmunk traps and his uh, granddaughter always comes and finds him and all, releases all the chipmunks. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, so, uh, well, anyway, I guess we, we, we got to start on it, don't you? Uh, Ivan, do you have any comments on it before we end? Because it's so beautiful. I mean, it's just a beautiful dream. Thank you, Dawn, um, too, for your comments. Yeah, I thought, I thought all the comments were really great. Um, I, I am also interested in what Don was interested in that uh, whether the shadow, it, whether uh, the anima is helping the shadow or if they just think that there is a different way to help. Um, what was the question there? Did you say the figure in the passenger seat represented an interior function or did you say the color of the car indicated that? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, she didn't hear because someone was talking to her at the time. Well, let's talk about that next time. Now, I, I kind of went off on some tangents here. And like, I think in, in all of the last three or four dreams, my initial take on it was wrong. So um, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll go through this thing in depth uh, next time. And uh, um, then Gary, you're up, so you better darn well start dreaming something. Don't tell me you don't have one, okay? And thank you so much, Charles and Roy and Sarah. I mean, it, I, I thought the last session was so good. What great contributions. So uh, good group, thank you. So we'll, we'll meet at, reconvene uh, uh, in, in about four or five days then, okay? Thank you, everybody. It's, it's All right, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, bye now.